I got a phone call. Are you spelling stalker? Not yet. <laughs> oh. Not yet, but a, a, a boy can dream. Um, but actually, that's funny you say that because I, this office got a call from Andre Agassi. And he said to me, they don't believe who I am. I didn't. I didn't. You called Andre to somehow find me. I became a stalker. Yeah, why? Thus beginneth the interview. Oh, my. You look fantastic. Why, thank you. And I'm not just saying that because you're incredibly powerful and wealthy. <laughs> and? <laughs> Keep going. What? What, and, what else? And? <laughs> um, thank you for doing this, by the way. Thanks for asking me. Well, for the record, you're a... I, I'm going to call her a non-traditional guest. Mm. Why? Well, because, um, because you're singular in your uniqueness. We've had documentarians and authors, and we've had dirty jobbers, and we've had a lot of different people on here. But I, um, I wanted to talk to you uh, <laughs> candidly because I, I'm kind of envious about the position you're in, but mostly I'm just curious. Mm. And, um, you know, by way of backstory, you've been very generous with the MicroWorks Foundation. And people should probably know how this happened, at least from my perspective. I got a phone call. Are you spelling stalker? Not yet. <laughs> oh. Not yet, but a, a, a boy can dream. Um, but actually, that's funny you say that because I, this office got a call from Andre Agassi. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, they don't believe who I am. I didn't. I didn't. He had to get through, like, I don't know, he had to get through Ashley or was ever answering the phones, and then Mary was like, no, this is not, this is, because I have a lot of friends who would yank my chain. Okay. So clearly one of them is impersonating Andre Agassi. And uh, he calls, and we finally get on the line, and he introduces you to me and tells me this completely unbelievable story. Um, but I'd like to hear it from you, actually. You called Andre to somehow find me. I became a stalker. Yeah, why? So, um, well, a few reasons. I think it just all kind of came together at the same time. I'd been very disillusioned with a lot of educational things that we'd been doing, mm -hmm. looking for other pathways. It just so happened I'm listening to a podcast. You're on the podcast. I was familiar with you and what you did, but not fully. This podcast? Or no, I was it was a guest on. on it, you were a guest on Megan Kelly's. Ah. And so <laughs> I um, listened to you and I thought, check, check, and check. Everything you're saying, exactly what I think. And so um, now how to find you. So <laughs> I thought, hmm, who do I know who might know people? Oh, Andre. So I called him and he said, do you think all famous people know each other? And I said, well, I'm calling you and I bet you find him. <laughs> and he said, fair enough, fine. And so... He said, I don't, but I can get somebody who probably does. Mm -hmm. And so another round of phone tag and um, said that they didn't believe who he was. He finally gets to you. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, he'll talk to the two of us together at first. And I said, OK. And so I remember being on the Zoom. And, um, and I've known Andre a long time and know him pretty well. And I watched him with you, and I thought, should I be in the room? Because there's a lot of bromance going here, and I can tell he's very enamored with what you're saying. And we hung up, and I was more convinced than ever I wanted to do something. And Andre called me right away, and um, he said, what about that voice? And I said, go oh, home to your wife. No, it's getting <laughs> Stop weird. talking to me. Yeah, and so, but I knew talking to you that it might be a pathway to do something different. And what I had seen traditionally doesn't work. Hmm. Well, thanks. I'm glad he reached out. It was a funny call. He's clearly Andre. I mean, you can't impersonate Andre on a Zoom call. He's, no. He's clearly him. You're clearly you. You've been supporting his foundation for how long? Oh, gosh, 20 years maybe. Wow. Something like that. And so people understand, uh, he, he does some pretty great work in Nevada. That's his home. Although he lived not far from where I live now, once upon a time in the Bay Area. I think he's had numerous homes, <laughs> yeah. uh, he, but he's a hometown boy. Yeah. And so, you know, the whole town loves him. He's the poster kid for our city, and he's a great ambassador for our city. And yeah. so 
where he could have made his money and walked away and lived his life, he felt a need to come back and do something about education. And this is from a guy who didn't finish high school. Mm-hmm. Marries Steffi, who also didn't finish high school because their parents determined they were going to play professional sports. Hmm. But they decided, both of them, that it was important to do something educationally. And so I, I just thought, you don't have to do this. The fact you want to do it, and you put so much of your time into it, I'm in. I'm in. So before you knew, who did you call to introduce you to Andre? <laughs> How did I do I didn't. Um, I think he asked to meet me. That sounds bad. Mm. I think he did. We had a mutual friend, and I think he knew I was interested in working in that space. And at mm-hmm. the time, he had his school. And it, I was invited to take a tour of the school with him. And that's just sort of where. And then we started going to dinner, and it's just sort of where it ended up. I don't want to get too bogged down in the details, but I'm so interested always in the the grout you know this the connective tissues and the and the way people wind up coming together and how people wind up learning that they might share a thing in common Mm -hmm. you know here you're listening to megan kelly i happen to be on you people start to triangulate but um you know andre decided to set up his foundation Mm -hmm. for his own reasons um i did the same Mm -hmm. you know we all take different paths your path is the most interesting to me because it's it's a truly Forrest Gumpian. <laughs> it's a very crooked line to, yeah. to be a woman in charge of about a billion dollars mm-hmm. that her her parents left to her, not just to distribute willy nilly, but they gave you parameters, they had a plan, mm-hmm. and you are now the custodian of all of that. So before we just kind of get into how you think about the the business of running a foundation. Tell me about your dad and your mom and what it was like to grow up in um, a family like that. I'm an only child. Uh, my mother's from German farmers and my dad's from a Norwegian family, so they were super warm and fuzzy. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but they really believed in work. That was That was the common denominator, it was work. And so I remember I was raised, I wanted for nothing. I was raised around people who had a lot. And um, what, what state? Las Vegas. So it started in Vegas. Because- uh, well, my dad, they, we came from North Dakota, Grand Forks, North Dakota, where all my family still is. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad was a builder. I won't even call him a contractor then. He was a builder. And the building season's pretty short in North Dakota. <laughs> like three weeks. So <laughs> if he came through Las Vegas on my parents' honeymoon and he just saw land and thought and loved the sun and thought, if I'm going anywhere, I'm going there. This is this mid-50s. is 1954. Mm-hmm. I'm born in 58. He comes out, leaves my mother and I with my grandparents, and he goes out and builds our house and sends for us, and my uncle drives us out with a U-Haul, and that's where I was raised. You know, not, I mean, my my life was, I was on a bicycle and in my bathing suit and jumping in pools and didn't know any different from anything, and... Um, was there money when you were a kid? Mm-hmm, there was money. But it, it was made very clear to me, this sounds horrible, it was made very clear to me it wasn't mine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was his. It was my mother's, and if I'm lucky, I get to get some benefits from it, but it's not mine. And I never thought, and then I just never thought it would be mine. I thought, okay, I understand. It's not. Fair enough. So when I'm sitting around at the table with them and my friends, I'm 13, and my friends are starting to talk about their cars and what they're going to drive, and I pipe in with what I want, and my dad just starts to laugh. He says, that's great. He goes, how are you going to pay for it? And I'm like pay for it and he said yeah so at the time he had um a motel at the very his first motel you'd hit coming from california at the strip Mm -hmm. and he said you can be a maid and i said okay and so my summers 13 14 15 16 i was a maid i had a full shift i did i can still believe me i can turn over a room in about 12 minutes (laughs) i make a corner like you cannot believe 
Wait, but I have to ask because yeah. now you stay in some in some pretty great hotels, right? Yeah. Uh, do you still, when you walk into a hotel room, is your is your first pr- perspective that of yes the maid? Yes, and I'm I'm very nice to the maids in the room. I'm super nice because it's not a fun job. No, oh my God. So I I was really proud of myself. Um, took me three summers to save up thirty five hundred dollars, and I bought a brand new Toyota Corolla, <laughs> and I loved that brown car. Loved it, loved it, and um, when the car gets delivered, I'm super pumped, and I go out and on the seat of the car is my thirty five hundred dollars. <clears throat> Uh, <laughs> that you know then i and i had a little um at that time a little passbook for a savings account yeah and he had it shoved in the envelope with it and said come and see me tomorrow we're going to talk about what you're going to do with that and i said okay and he said you know had you not worked this wouldn't be here and you're how old again 16 i'm 16 back to the actual job mm. for a minute not to belabor <laughs> the point but um you know you can always tell when you're out, when I'm out to dinner with people who waited tables, mm-hmm. I can always tell. Mm-hmm. And you know, as what don't people know about the business of a hotel maid that they should know? Not just maids. I think I worked every position you could. I mean, from the front desk and sales and the cage, and I think they don't understand how hard service is, <laughs> and that especially when maids are doing things, these are the people you don't see. And I know you want to have fun and not pick up after yourself as you do at home. But there is some consideration to not treating people poorly. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people think about that often enough. The bed didn't make itself. These things didn't happen on their own. You don't have to call and demand things. What can people do as guests in rooms that just would make the job of a maid a little simpler, a little more humane? I mean, just just basic, basic things. Oh, well, I mean, flush your toilet. There you go. How about oh, that? There you go. That's, that would that's be a, a nice bar. one. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's about where you're at. Mm. Could you flush your toilet? Would be awesome. <laughs> I'm not asking a whole lot. Okay. <laughs> and Good. I'm going to get in and out of your room as fast as I can, too. Believe me. I, I read a horrifying report, and I'm, I think I did a story once on the, uh, the condition of <laughs> rooms cool. in various hotels vis-a-vis... Uh, Black light, right? Oh, ooh. so people go in with a black light, and 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 you would think that the Motel Sixes and maybe the Holiday Inn Expresses would be at the low end of the most disappointing things that that black light could reveal, mm-hmm. and that maybe as you get into a better class of hotels, Ritzes and Four Seasons and whatnot, you'd see, uh, you know, just a heightened level of civilization. Uh, <laughs> yes. Vis-a-vis flush toilets, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but that's not true. No, because the time you spend costs money. And so when you're a maid and you get your chart and you get, have either stayovers or changeovers, mm-hmm. stayovers you know, take you less time because you're not changing out the linens unless they request it. You're not changing those things out unless you're asked. Yeah. Changeovers, you're doing it, but you're never changing out those duvets and those comforters. Those things go out maybe once or twice a year. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, I do stay in nice hotels now. I do not like to lay on top of those. Yeah. And the remote control. Uh, yeah, no thanks. Yeah. No. Well, this uh, black light, and forgive me, I, I didn't think we were going to go here, but I, <laughs> but I do feel the need because my <laughs> listeners expect it. Um, the, the, the fluids that ah. the black light can reveal. Yes. All right. Now, these are universal. I mean, we're all just made the way we are, and we all produce the same sorts of things. But it's the it's it's the it's the quantity of the fluids, and and their location mm. that, that varies so dramatically. Mm-hmm. And the point I'm trying to make is, while you would think it'd be a full on bacchanalia in a Motel Six, right? It's not, but it is in the Four Seasons. And it, it it's not it's not again. You know what I'm talking about, Chuck. These fluids. I don't. I don't want to. No, know. Chuck doesn't know what you're I, saying. I don't. Yeah, can you spell it out to me like I'm a small child, Mike? <laughs> All right, Chuck. Well, when a man and a woman love each other uh-huh. very much, they Mommy get together <laughs> sometimes in strange rooms oh. where they pay for by by the by the day, sometimes by the hour. Oh, okay. Right. Uh-huh. Now that which is left behind can be identified with the help of a black light. All right. All right. And the location of those fluids in a Four Seasons are far more esoteric and ambitious 
than in a Motel 6. And I would love to get your take on why you think that might be. I, I have no idea. <laughs> However, I, I will tell you mm-hmm. that the real hazard, at least if you're a maid in Las Vegas, I would imagine other cities, people come to Las Vegas, they're depressed, they oh, take their money yeah. out, yeah. and they have a really good time, and that's how the maid gets to find them. Oh. And that is not uncommon at all. I would think probably every maid out there who's worked for any length of time has. Has stumbled across a... uh, You just have. Yeah. It's just what people do. They come and have one big last hurrah. Yeah. And then... Check, please. Don't answer their door. Until the maid comes in. Until the maid comes and can't quite get that bathroom door open enough and then... Oh. Oh, then it's open. Oh, and now I have to go home for the day because I can't think. So, because suddenly that unflushed toilet ain't so bad. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> I'll, t- <laughs> I'll take the toilet. Don't yeah. even care. That thing care. in the tub, that's no, not what no, I wanted no. to see. Did oh, that happen to you? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> More than once? Yeah. Oh, wow. Mm. More than three times? Yep. Holy cow. What's the number? Um, I'm going to say probably four. And I'm going to count the one where I was in the kitchen and we heard this and the top of the ceiling tile did this, and we thought, kind of the air handler, or what, what's happening? <laughs> oh, no. And call maintenance, they go up and they go, nope. Oh. Came off of the 17th floor, and I'm like, okay. Oh. So. Good grief. But I mean, people in the pits of despair, right? Mm-hmm. I, they don't know what they're thinking, doing, or whatever their issue is, and they don't think beyond that. Yeah. They're not going to think about the person who's going to come and find them. Wow. That's the so first, I'll take that's the toilet first, again. That's the first thing I would think about. <laughs> well, because right. you're not that depressed, right? Yeah, you're, you're not, not depressed yet. You're not okay. there where you just, oh, <clears throat> you can't think beyond anything but that. Well, I got that going for me. There you go. It's nice. You yeah, know, you the, day's, the, toilet. the day's looking up. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I, <clears throat> yeah, you have flushed. The, you always flush. I mean, I, I you know, I mean. Yeah, Double flush I, I sometimes. Think so. Yeah. Sometimes With a courtesy flush. flush. Oh, yeah. So. My We're not an animal. I hope so. We're not animals. I love that. I belabor the point only because, you know, to be 16, to have discovered uh, four suicides, to have cleaned up God knows how much, Hmm. right? Now, your dad knows this is going to happen because he's a man of the world. Yep. And so he's not babying his little girl. Uh, He's not babying his little girl at all. In fact, I was, um, I think I was his little buddy. I was somebody who accompanied him and... um, I was on construction sites with him, and I would travel with him on the weekends. And um, no, he, I think he wanted to prepare me for the world. And he knew they weren't going to be around forever, and what am I going to do? And he would say to me often, <clears throat> in my, my dad wasn't a very prolific guy as far as how he spoke, mm-hmm. but he would say to me, you're a mark. Mm. You're going to be a mark. Yeah. And if you're going to look for somebody who's going to provide for you like I have and give you a home like I have and the lifestyle I have, you're always going to be disappointed because Mm. it doesn't happen. This is an anomaly. So you better be happy. You better be self-sufficient. You better know how to do that. And so it's just there was no complaining in my house. There was none of that. I mean, even when when my dad was sick, when when I was sick. You just didn't sit around and talk about it. You get you get with it. Nobody cares. Well, like, what am I going to do about it? Right. I'm, I, I'm that's sad, but I don't know what I can do for you with that. What are you going to do about it? I like Ralph. You know, I mean, it's it's great to have the the clear eyed understanding that you want your kid to pay some semblance of of dues, but the the managing of the expectations is also great. I mean, to say straight up, you're a target. Yeah. People are going to know this, and so gird your uh, gird your loins. Yeah. As it be were. careful. Prepare yourself. Be really careful. Were you? Not always. <laughs> I wished I was. I wished I'd listened to him more. I wished I'd really understood what he was trying to say to me sometimes. Yeah. But you know, he was my dad. So not everything. I didn't think everything was a pearl that he was passing on to me. And I thought, you don't know. You don't know, Dad. He knew. Was he, did he build the casinos? Mm-hmm. That's did how he... he started everything, because he was a builder. He bought the land 
The land was center of the strip across from Caesars. Land, land, land. Yeah. Um, and he uh, built, he bought a small motel, tore it up, built a hotel, did the same thing with, he did the Las Vegas Speedway in town. Mm-hmm. Um, couldn't care less about racing. Decided it was a niche that was missing, so built it. His whole thing was just building. He was a builder. That's what he did. So he didn't. He didn't own the casino. He owned it. Oh, he owned it. He built. He was the sole operator in in the town. Yeah. Well, I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, but that's a bit more than a builder. When I was growing up, people would say, "What does your dad do?" And I didn't know what to say. And I. I remember I'd said it to my mother. I said, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to say to that. She goes, he's self-employed. <laughs> I said, well, that doesn't answer anything. And so I'd say to him, what do you do? I do things. Don't worry. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, but, but but can you be specific? Can I give some, like, this guy's dad's of this? And can you give me an answer? Look around you. I built this. This is what we, this is what we do. Figure it out. Okay. Thanks for the clarity. So what do you do? I mean, I think I know, but I mean, what's your business card say? How do I you answer I don't have that business question? cards. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have my assistants in my purse, though. If you want something, I'll give you hers. <laughs> uh, Apple's not too far from the I don't tree. know what, you know what? That's interesting because I dislike the word philanthropist. I think it's a really weird, it sounds to me like, ladies turn of the century in new york mm. who went to the orphanages and handed out i don't know it, it, it seems weird to me a little haughty maybe a bit i think and this isn't nobody would understand this either but i think the most accurate thing i do is i'm a steward mm. i didn't make this money i watched it happen my dad passed away my mother was had no interest and didn't know how to do it and so um I knew that my job would be Hold to on. grow it. Your dad it. passed away. He was relatively young. 72. He's uh, been gone 22 years. Lung cancer. Lung cancer. Mm-hmm. Quick. Really pretty fast, yeah. Faster than he expected, for sure. Tell me. He was diagnosed, and as I had d- described to you before, he was a guy who, he was a real alpha. He took charge. He fixed it. If you had a problem, he can make it go away. And then he gets a diagnosis, and he thought, okay, no problem, I got this, and went along his way, and things weren't going as well as he had expected. Um, By the time he was available to fly around and try different trials, he wasn't eligible. And so by the time we fly down to Texas, they open him up, they closed him, and said to all of us, just take him home. And that was three weeks later he died. And so it wasn't until those final three weeks he absolutely thought he was going to live. And I saw the most pissed off human being because he just couldn't believe that this was happening. He couldn't believe. He couldn't fix this. That is, I mean, that's that's a builder. That, that That's a guy who spent his life knowing that the solution to the problem would involve a, a saw or a level or, you know, a, ta- a, a tool-driven tangible thing, a scalpel in this case. Mm-hmm. So he, he, he skipped over fear and went straight to indignation and anger. He was just furious. He was absolutely furious. And so you get three weeks to, and my mother is in shock. My mother's primarily just interested in being his caretaker and charting all his medicines and does he sleep at night and what can she do? And so um, there's three weeks of a flurry of people coming into the house of planning. How do we get rid of all the real estate? How do we get rid of the warehouses? And he had spoken about selling one of the hotels at one point and then became very serious about not telling anybody he was sick because then they would take the price down of the property. Hmm. So we were all, nobody could say anything. And, um, and, and he did do enough. He told me a few things, a few people would be calling me as soon as he died and what they would want. And I said, I, well, I, okay. 
And sure enough, exactly the people he told me called me maybe a day or two after he died. And, um, hey, you know that that picture? And, you know, um, and I'm like, yeah, I'm giving it to my son. Wow. Yeah, and I wouldn't have known. I would have let them buy it. I didn't know the value of it. Yeah. Um, so did that, did that jaundice you? I mean, did it make you feel angry or sad? Both. I think that I, um, because my mom was a wreck, and uh, I am an only child, and I think the reason I look back and think the reason he had me with him all those times is people paid me very little attention, which was really a blessing because I was with him all the time in meetings, and I would just sit, and I'd listen, and I'd watch, and I'd hear everybody. And I'd watch the guy who was sitting there who couldn't be further up my dad rear end mm. and then I'd watch him walk out and I'd hear how he spoke to the assistants out front and how horrible he was yeah and I just kind of cataloged it it's like oh now I know who you are yeah I know exactly who you are he's the guy who doesn't flush the toilet in the room mm-hmm. he's the guy who snaps his fingers mm-hmm. at the waitress mm-hmm. and what's the word unctuous I mean, and he's talking to a guy that my dad would never allow anybody in the hotel to call him Mr. Ingolstead. He was Ralph. And if there was, in in fact, every night he'd go and sit at the bar, have his usual drink, and... um, What was that? Well, he called it a VD. (laughs) It was a vodka and Diet Coke. (laughs) But he loved loved to order a VD and watch people make a face, and I go, why do you do that? (laughs) You know what you're doing. Because I'm Ralph Ingolstead. Because I know what I'm saying, and I can't. So we're sitting there, and there's a cigarette butt, and my dad gets up, and my dad is, there's a little shovel and things, and the little sweeper, and he's sweeping it up, and one of the uh, porters came and saw him and went, oh, 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 my, oh, don't do that. He goes, no, because my job, not a problem. I can do it. So he just, that's what he did. And so it never occurred to me that you lived any differently. So I was, I was angry. I was angry at cancer. I was angry at him. I was angry at the situation. And then I think it was a week before, between when he died and we buried him. And um, I don't think I actually grieved for about a year. I think I was just in auto because there were so much going on, so many things to settle, so many things to try to wrap my hands around, as well as take care of my mother, that... um, I don't think I really sat and had a good cry for about a year. Mm. Had the foundation already been formed when he when he died? On paper. It, it was very loose on paper. Had it been funded? It was going it, we were left the directives of where when we were selling these assets, the assets were to go into the foundation. Anything he hadn't carved out for anybody. Um, so I knew where it was going, and I knew what it was supposed to do. And I, I obviously had a sense of his own sensibilities, what he would or would not fund. Now, I will say that as the years have gone on, that's changed. I think giving money away has changed, and what the expectations are has changed. Um, and I don't think he, he, he would, if he saw the world we're in now, he might change some of the, his ideas too. But, um, you know, I could see some needs, especially in our city, and so that's sort of where we went and what we're doing with it. Here's why I like you. Andre makes the introduction. I hop on the phone, and now I realize, okay, it's Chris Ingolstadt, and there's a fair amount of money, and she would like to help MicroWorks, and and that's nice. And you didn't really ask me a lot about the foundation. Mm. You asked me about my granddad. Mm -hmm. And you kind of kept at it way I'm keeping at you now and I liked that because you know this foundation modest though it is is a is a tribute to him and so is dirty jobs um but but the weight of it it's not heavy on me but the older I get the more I the more I realize oh I'm I'm doing that because of this and so cause and symptoms right so here you are now like we've given away maybe 10 million dollars in work ethic scholarships yeah 
Europe that are only like 300 million or something like that. Um, and that's just one area. You've got buckets all over the yep. place. Uh, my point is, it, it, it seems intensely complicated and ever-changing, but in the end, how do you feel the weight of your, of your dad and his wishes? Mm. And, and, and how do you weigh and measure, ultimately, the people you, you decide to assist? I don't feel a weight. I don't. I feel, I do feel a responsibility um, because I watched him every single day. He was the guy who, if I looked at my watch, I knew exactly where he was because that's what he did that time of day. Mm. I never remember him being sick. I never remember him staying home. Um, and so, you know, those things count. And yes, he was successful. But there were many years when he first came to town where, you know, it was a struggle to make a payroll. I got to pay these guys. What am I going to do? So I, I'm just cognizant of what that was. And I think he had the same feeling about his dad. So uh, my dad at one point got very heavily into cars. And um, he had 780 when he died. <laughs> I know. That's, that's, that's a few. That must have been an awfully big garage. Well, here's his problem, <laughs> is that he never had a hobby. So he found a truck that reminded him of what his dad drove as a salesman. And it was a, T, a Ford, and it had you know the wood in the back. Mm -hmm. And my dad bought one and rehabbed the whole thing. And then, of course, well, then I need all the trucks like this. And, well, then if I'm going to do that, I'm going to have to have guys to work on it. And, well, if I'm going to do that, I have to have a guy go to Europe and buy all the parts. And if I go, oh, well, I have to have a museum now. It's like, do you do anything that's just for fun? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so when he passed, we sold everything except we kept that Model T. Yeah. which is in my mom's garage now. But he, he had that feeling about his dad. And so um, I don't think it really matters what the dollar amount is. It's what you watch them do. For me, that was the inspiring part. Mm -hmm. of um, I, I, I think for me, the worst sin is complacency. Mm. And so if you're going to sit and just do nothing, I don't get the point. I just don't get it. If, if you're a pain in the ass about it, great. If you make your feelings known, fine. If you vote with your dollar, fine. But to have no thoughts and no opinions to do it, not to do anything, I just, I don't get it. And I find that I'm surrounded by a lot of that and I don't understand it. I, I don't know if it's a theory, but I, I think about that. The jagged little pills are a lot more interesting than those smooth rounded suppositories. Mm -hmm. Oh, what a horrible Do we metaphor. keep going to toilets? I, I, okay. I'm sorry, but, but um, when I think of retirement and, and, and I think about the way that's been baked into the, the path that most people sort of assume they're going to take and, and the way it's been positioned as a reward and as a wish fulfillment, you know, I, I, think, I think it's completely wrong. I, I think it's completely, I think it's wrecking people's lives long before they get to the place where they could retire. Your dad didn't sound like a guy who had ever contemplated it. He could never. He could never. And his brother loved to boat and liked to do things. My dad thought it was a colossal waste of time. Hmm. Colossal waste of time. Why are you doing that? I don't know, because it brings him ha joy, happiness. And it, he'd just be like, yeah, <laughs> he didn't. He didn't understand it. It didn't. So I mean, for him, no, he was never going to stop working. Um, I think when you come from North Dakota and you come from these people, that is the way it is. Mm -hmm. And for me, look, since I've been doing this really since I was thirteen, in one way or another, I can't imagine what that would look like. Um, my kids are both involved now. I've got a 30-year-old son and a 27-year-old daughter. I met them. Yes, Perfect people. thank you. And um, I think they kind of look at me like, hey, TikTok, old lady, when, when's this going to end? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I think, okay, I might wind it down a bit for me and not be there every day, but I just can't imagine I'm going to stay home and do what? 
I want to ask you broadly about the world of philanthropy. And I know you don't love the word, but I sat next to you not long ago at a, at a dinner. Mm-hmm. And we were in a good-sized room, and there were a lot of people in that room with a, with a lot of money, and they had all gathered because they, they wanted to uplift some ideas and some organizations. This is Stand Together. We, it's not a secret. Mm-hmm. You know, we, they've, they've supported us, and I go there, and I, th- I think I even gave something approaching a speech that evening. You I, did. Something. Spoke about a poem. Oh, right. That's what you did, yeah. See, I paid attention. Uh, which yeah, poem, Mike? <laughs> it was uh, Two Tramps in Mud Time. Oh, you love that one. I do love that poem a lot because it marries vocation and avocation. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that to me is a big chunk of whatever the American dream means to me, you know. But, but my question is sitting there. With, with, with all these quasi-like-minded bloody do-gooders who have access to an awful lot of dough, mm-hmm. you know, how do, how do you think about really using this as, as wisely as you can? And, and how is the Ingolstadt Foundation targeted and, and, and focused today? Did your dad leave parameters or did you get some leeway to... He really didn't leave much in the way of parameters. I think he trusted my mother and I that we knew him and knew his heart and that we would steward it the best way that we could. Mm-hmm. Um, but we didn't get any marching orders. I mean, things were happening quickly. So that's just how we had to do things. I, I think how it's changed for me, though, is that for a very long time, I didn't experience any joy whatsoever in handing out any gifts. Um, even if I thought they were going to a good cause, there was something about writing the check and sending it out that I just thought, and eh. I mean, it feels almost like monopoly money at some point. You go, okay, I, I know I did something good, but I don't feel it at all. And so I decided at that point I had to do it a little differently. And I'm more interested in projects and things that I can see that we can maybe do something to change a system Mm -hmm. we can do something to fix something at a root level that is broken Mm -hmm. otherwise i feel like i'm just band-aiding and it doesn't feel like i'm getting anything done and and here's your check and i'll see you again next year because you're gonna have the same problem next year we fix nothing i don't uh want to presume to put you on some sort of metaphorical couch but could that feeling have anything to do with the fact that the $3,500 wasn't left on the seat of the Corolla for the people that you're helping? In other words, where's their made story? Where, wh- what did you see them do to, to earn it? Maybe, that's, maybe I'm saying it the yeah, wrong no. way. You have to do your diligence, obviously, but you don't have that personal. I mean, it's just interesting to me. It, I think some of them saw me growing up and felt sorry for me <laughs> because, well, they were all having... They were going to the lake and they had, I was getting in my, you know, getting, going to work with my dad because I couldn't drive yet and cleaning. Um, But God, you know, I look back on, I could point to all kinds of them that have had stories and things happen that they were just ill-equipped to bounce back from at all. Yeah. They just couldn't. And I think some of it goes back to that. So what do you do now to make the, the gift giving a little more joyful on your part and hopefully, you know, more impactful on the recipient. Well, I do things that I think I'm interested in replicating. So I do things that I think could be taken nationally. One of them is um, a place that we've named after my mother called Betty's Village. And it is housing for people with um, uh, Down syndrome primarily. Mm -hmm. But disabilities. And so, you know, they're living longer and longer and their parents can't keep them. And it really resembles a college quad. It's got a pool and a park and a rec room and all these brightly colored buildings that they get to come and live with their friends. You know, they didn't get to see their friends before. They would go home and sit on the couch on a Friday, get picked up by the bus on Monday. Now they all hang and they're They have friends. I think their life is better. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a cousin who has a son at my son's age with Down syndrome, and they live in North Dakota. 
There is no such facility up there. So I look at that and think, okay, it's an idea. We're building Betty's 2 now Mm -hmm. um, because there's such a demand for it. There's such a waiting list. And I think, okay, we could take that. We could move that. We could move it to another community. I think that with the program you and I are doing. Mm -hmm. I think we'll see what this little experiment looks like. And if it works, I don't know why we couldn't roll it out, whether it's national, it's another school in Vegas, whichever it is. I just think there are things that could be done rather than handing somebody a check or handing, it, it just, I think it somehow loses meaning. Um, just by way of exposition, uh, what, what Chris is talking about is a work ethic curriculum that we've had in the works here for a couple of years based on that sweat pledge hanging on the wall that finally got finished and we got it into some trade schools, but we really had a difficult time getting it into big public high schools, mm -hmm. as you may have noticed. Um, you know, there's boards and there's bureaucracies and layers upon layers of stuff. Right. But something really great happened in Clark County at a high school called Western, where they were open to the idea of taking this curriculum, but it was your idea to say, let's attach a very specific gift to it. Mm -hmm. So the kids in this class, something like 750 kids. Right. Right? So Big. The, so the top 50 or maybe 100. They've had 80 families yeah. that came to the initial meeting and are said they're interested. Now, I think that'll end up being 50. Mm -hmm. Just at the end of four years, you have some fallouts and life happens. Right. But I think if we end up with 50 at the end, that's a, I think that's success. Oh, my God. Look. Well, the, Can you explain the program for our, our listeners? Yeah. That's what we're in the midst of doing, Charles. Were you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is the, hang on every word to this. Yeah. It's, it's real simple because with your help, we've got... I, I don't know what the ultimate amount will be, but it, it looks like between four and five million dollars mm -hmm. attached for the top 50, the top people who they, they get through the program. And that's a free ride to any trade school in the country. Yes. So, not a university. No. A trade school. Why does that matter to you? Well, again, I guess because my dad was a builder. Um, he did go to college, but he was a builder. And... The way that he got to college was a scholarship. He was uh, loading boxcars on a railroad on the summers. And there happened to be a professor that also was doing that and starts talking to my dad. He goes, you're a smart guy. Why aren't you going to school? And my dad said, well, I can't afford that. He said, get a scholarship. My dad had never heard the word. <laughs> so, you know, I play hockey. Good, get a hockey scholarship. And he did. And it was something I heard about all the time as to what he thought made a difference in his life. So when I started listening to what you did, um, I contacted a friend in Las Vegas who does a lot of educational work, and I just said, tell me the, tell me the worst performing high school. And she didn't hesitate, Western. Mm -hmm. It's one of the oldest ones, one of the originals. It's in the kind of the center of townish. The difference is now is that the principal is a really dynamic guy. And he gets his kids, he understands them, uh, he was them. Mm -hmm. And so they have a huge dropout rate. And because we're such a transient town, you don't keep track of really everybody. Sometimes they just don't come back to school and you don't know what happened. Right. So I think he was so open to saying there's another pathway to be successful. And it's also the challenge in our town is there's so many jobs that pay cash. Mm -hmm. So if I wanna go be a valet parker, I do some things. And I've been failed by the school system. So I don't think I'm very smart. I don't think I understand things, but I can go out here and make some cash. You're gonna tell me I need to do how many more years of what? Mm -hmm. And I don't get it but this is something you can get. This is something you can actively work on and you can do. And the point I try to sell to all of them is, you have the ability to change your family tree. You're too young, you don't understand what that is, but you have the ability to show the brother people coming up what you can do. 
there are other pathways to doing something to make you successful. And so I, I think it's something that's going to resonate. And it's something that resonates with parents for sure. Well, it resonates with us. I can tell you that because to your point, it is, it is something that could be duplicative, you know, and I've been noisy as I can about it. And, and we've heard from other people in other states who are in your position, not quite in your position, but who, you know, people ought to understand if you, when you run a foundation like yours, you're, mm -hmm. you're legally bound to disgorge a percentage of the every assets year. every year. Yep. So to do that thoughtfully, I yes. will say is a challenge. Okay. If I wanted to just write checks, we could. But again, what is what am I doing? Am I doing more harm than good? Am I accomplishing anything? Hmm. Or do I really need to do some due diligence, figure out who somebody is, what this does or does not mean for them? And and then I can give it in a thoughtful manner, but that takes time to to really do the work. And that's why, thank God, my daughter is all over it. She is, you know, on the ground running. Do, in like in a, in a diligence way? Looking oh, yeah. for the right she opportunities? Is, she, um, she is my kid. And she uh, takes things very seriously. And it's really, you know, she thinks with her heart. Mm -hmm. And um, she wants to help people and fix things. So what other initiatives really have your focus right now? And again, I'm talking broadly. Is it education? Is it healthcare? And are you mostly staying in Nevada and North Dakota, or are you expanding geographically? Um, we else? have been across the country. We are now doing this. We're shrinking it back because um, what we're doing is we're taking a hard reset for this year and into probably the first quarter of next year. If I want my kids to be part of this and to really have a legacy piece in this and to feel it and to pass it on to theirs and theirs, they've got to find the thing that lights them up. It may not be education. It might be environmental. It might, well, I don't know what it'll be, but we need to take a second for everyone to think about it and come back and say, this is how I want to do it. Fine, there's more than one way to do this. We can, we can do this. And so, we do stick to Las Vegas a lot more because it's my backyard. I know it. I understand it. I'm not opposed to going elsewhere. I just found when we were outside of Las Vegas, it was much harder to try to keep an eye on it or to figure out what was really going on. Because it's such a unique place with such unique challenges. You mentioned it's transient, mm -hmm. but it's so much more than, I mean, it's so rooted in tourism. Yep. It's so hot. <laughs> yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it really, it's its like a crucible in some ways. It, it, yep. it, it will shape you, you know. It, it obviously or you just you. cry and whine a lot, or which break is you. my go-to. Yeah. <laughs> so what's, back to the college thing. Mm. There's been some press. I saw your name pop up recently. Yeah. Um, in and, vain, I think, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I... It's funny, I, I wrote something recently, kind of a, not really an open letter, but there was such uh, dissatisfaction among wealthy donors mm -hmm. to the Ivy League, uh, to the point where they're affirmatively withholding. I'm right there with them. Hundreds of millions of dollars, mm -hmm. affirmatively withholding it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like going, you know, hey fellas, is that money really burning a hole in your pocket? I mean, because, we, we're doing another thing. Isn't it funny how nobody burns a flag at a trade school? Isn't it weird how you don't see a lot of protests at the, you know, Lincoln Electric or, mm -hmm. you know, plumbing schools and whatnot? Well, it's the same reason I explain to people about the people in the Midwest. My family, they're farmers or mechanics. Um, we have some nurses. Uh, but they get up at 4.30 in the morning and they go out and they work hard and they come in well past the time the sun goes down and they care about can they pay their mortgage are their kids healthy can they afford insurance um, can they take their vacation a year and what your pronouns are doesn't ever enter their heads and it's not that they're haters it's not they'll they'll address you any way you like but it's not in their 
top 20 or 30 things that are important to them because they're just trying to have a family. <laughs> that, that's the difference. And so I think the further you get out from there to the coastlines, people look at someone in the Midwest maybe as being a little simple or not understanding. And No, they understand plenty. They get it. Yeah. They just have different priorities. Do you think it's more challenging, uh, this, I'm generalizing, I suppose, but to run a billion-dollar business or, or a billion-dollar foundation? I think it's challenging to do anything well. <laughs> That's what I think. And whether you're profit-making or you're profit-distributing, um, I think it, it's hard. And look, I've made, I've made mistakes. I've given out some cash sometimes that, I, that just came back and bit me. And then I learned, and then I don't do that anymore. So Yeah, but without naming names, how, how does that happen? I mean, did you not do sufficient diligence, or was you, were you dealing with a bad actor? Both. In some cases, a little of each. Um, and then I just, you know, can't believe that I, that one got past me. So mm -hmm. I, I double down and don't do that again. But it's, you know, it's the same thing as you brought up with the letter you read. You reach a point where enough's enough. And then you have to call it. You basically withheld a generous donation from a big college. We have given $45.5 million in total to the university in Las Vegas. Um, I am so disillusioned by how it is run S poorly. Uh, much more thought is given to administration and their own perseverance and preservation than there is to the students. Mm. And so I reiterated that I would absolutely continue all the scholarships we have going because it goes directly to the kid, and I'm not going to penalize them. But I will never give them another penny. They don't deserve it. Wow. They don't deserve it. I mean, you can put yourself out as higher ed. That's great. You have a massive budget. You need to allocate it correctly. You need to pay attention to your students. You need to pay attention to everybody. You need to pay attention to your donors, frankly. Um, and not, I, I mean, I'll give you an example out of it. We, with the help of four other donors, built the med school. They tried for many years to build a med school, couldn't quite do it, um, told us that we couldn't do it. And there's four women and we just got really pissed. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, can't we? I think we can. And we built it. We didn't have to use public works, so we built it well under budget. It's a $120 million school that got built in no time, and it's just stunning. They get the use of it. That's all they have to do, come in and just appreciate it. But we started getting ugly letters from their legal department. They wanted the building handed over to them now. Our facilities director who'd go over to just make sure everything's being taken care of. She was denied access to the building. It got very hostile very quickly. What is that? I mean, are you a threat? Is I it... don't know. I, I can only liken it to if somebody comes to your home and brings you a gift, and you look at it, and it might be the ugliest thing you've ever seen. You go, thank you, and you put it in the regifting closet. Mm -hmm. But you don't look at it and go, what else? Right. That's what they do. And so I, I'm... I, I don't get lack of gratitude. Look, I am a very low maintenance person as far as I will pay you not to go to a gala. I don't need a plaque. I don't want my name anywhere. Please, please don't just forget I'm even there. You told me that once. What was it? Some of you gave a million bucks to somebody somewhere and they oh. were like, where do you want your name? Where do you want the plaque? Yeah, please, no. Please, no. Um, and so it's not that. There is a basic gratitude level. And so we have nine acres that surround this building. And our plan, because Las Vegas is a desert in so many ways, including uh, doctors, mm -hmm. we, we leave. Something goes on, we're out. And so we were going to build another building next door that had uh, mental health, had a blood bank, um, had uh, an autistic awareness group, ex several different things. I said to the university, probably for seven months, mental health doesn't pay for itself. We need to come up with a formula and other disciplines that will pay for it. 
they'd keep coming back to the table, everything but mental health. Nothing, they can never get there. And I finally said to the dean of medicine at one point, I said, what don't you understand? We're having mental health. And he said, mental health has a stigma. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, and you're a doctor. So can we do something about that? But they walked out and I thought, there's no, there's no getting there with you guys. And so when I decided to part ways, uh, the only statement the president gave was that um, they're very sorry our negotiations fell apart and that, uh, but they still have those nine acres. I'm like, you don't even know what you don't have. You gave us the nine acres. We own the nine acres. We were going to build the buildings. What negotiations would we have with you? I don't understand. I, either. What? We had discussions about what else you could do. But clearly, you they didn't understand a public partner, a public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. Truly, they acted like we invented this. This is very easy. It's very simple. They don't get the concept. What they like is the old-fashioned donating. Donating. We need fifty thousand dollars. Okay, give me the check. Please don't talk to me again. And I'll come back and see you next year. No strings, no fuss. No, just give me the money. Yeah. Yeah. And don't ask how I use it. Don't don't ask me to account for It'll it. It'll be your privilege to give it to us. Oh, please, dear God, <laughs> let me give it right. to you, please. Look, I, I I hope this doesn't sound like you know sour grapes or kvetching or but but I, I people need to understand how and it's not just universities but there are a lot of institutions who get in their own way mm -hmm. and for whatever reason just can't seem to accept a gift and and treat a donor is it respect is I think it it's such a weird position like it's so unusual it's such an odd thing to do that I I think generally people look at me like I'm a walking ATM, and um, I think the idea is, and I've only noticed this when I have turned down a gift request, it's kind of indignant. Mm. And, and I think the attitude is, well, you have it. What difference does it make to you? And it's like, well, I, I get what you're saying. But just because we have it doesn't mean, look, it doesn't belong to me. So just because I happen to have some control over this doesn't mean I have to do what you want me to do. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's an entitlement. It's an expectation. It's, look, I'm just having a hard time, you know, and, and I, I know you are too, and I know a lot of other people are too, but when you, when you talk about forgiving, when you talk about forgiving a student loan, from a Harvard grad. Mm. Harvard has $51 billion in an endowment. Oh, I know. $51 billion. Uh -huh. And they're still out fundraising. What? <laughs> I'm like, I, what? what can I do for you? <laughs> I, and I don't even know where, where Stanford is. Probably close. Probably all along the same. So, I mean, they still have legacy programs. They mm -hmm. still have alumni. They still have... All this, all these donations. They're still getting money from the feds. There's, mm -hmm. so, I, 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 I don't have a question. I just want to say, man, how much patience is required in your world to, I, to just I, st to simply stay sane. I think the biggest problem for me personally is that I have a very long fuse, and it's arguably too long. And I let it go and go and go until I finally, I'm done. And when I'm done, I'm done. But I need to, and this I think is my lesson from this last incident, is I need to really shorten that fuse. Because when, you know that old saying, um, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them? Believe them. Yeah. I think I spend a lot of time going, no, it can't be that. He didn't mean that. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. And so... Yes, I believe who you who you show me you are now. And I'm just not willing to stick around and find out what else happens. A quick yes or no. To duel if necessary. I've been told that yes I'm <laughs> no. I've been told I'm very terse. Mm. Once, like, once like the well, I guess down. I guess there's no everyone knows where they stand with you and I said probably. I hope probably. so. 
So is the fuse going to get shorter? Yes. The... <laughs> wow. Yes. How it got short, short right was there. that? Yeah. Well, <laughs> look, I'm not going to read it. No, but I, it but just, I, it just I, was. I, you know, <sighs> if you allow yourself to be taken advantage of, and I have far too many times, I think, or I gave a little extra leeway or a little extra grace, thinking you would, you could use that time, you'd be able to do it. I, I don't I don't think I was right very often with those. I think more often I was wrong. And I should have pulled plugs way sooner, not gotten involved to begin with, or pulled the plug sooner. I just love the fact that you're out there looking. Looking for something that, that feels like character or something that that your dad would recognize and, and give you a thumbs up for and wh- whether you're calling your inner circle and Andre Agassi is calling me and I I just want people to know that, you know, Bush got a lot of crap for this, but that whole um, thousand points of light mm-hmm. thing, remember? Yeah. Well, that's you. You're, oh, well. you're one of the points of light, you know? And sometimes it's, it's, it's a church and sometimes it's this and that, but, but mostly I don't, I don't think the feds are going to fix this, this college thing. I don't think any institution is going to fix anything. I don't either. And I also think, I, this is very pessimistic, but unless there is a huge, complete blow up, I don't see it changing because it's not just, it, it doesn't matter. So an example. We have a very nice president of the University of North Dakota right now. Mm. He's a very nice guy, and I like him. But we sat through four presidents before that that weren't so nice. And it's it, it's a, a, a symptom of bad governance, you know, bo- boards of regents that don't function. Um, you get a president in, you get, you know, all the provosts and the people around them, and it's just this trickle down you're going to have to wipe that slate clean. And I don't see that happening. I don't yeah. get how that would be. It's certainly not in my lifetime. It's not. You know, I say that sometimes it's just in a general way, it feels like things have to go splat. You know, it, it, it's got to get a little worse maybe before it gets better. But I don't know what role my listeners can play in that other than stomping their feet and saying, wait, look, look what, like if I were a taxpayer in Nevada, Mm -hmm. And I read the article that just came out Mm -hmm. about how the biggest college there, university, is is squandering money that might ultimately, tell me if I'm wrong, but might ultimately have to be made up for in the tax base at some point. I mean... Well, we had, there's an example. We were a university in Reno, UNR, UNLV, each were given money from ARPA funds. We were What's tasked that? with, it's the leftover money you get from different, it was COVID stuff. So we were each tasked with what you were supposed to do with it. Our governor currently wanted a blood bank. We didn't have a blood bank. Shock. So, um, but because you're dealing with the university system, UNR was very savvy. They got their marching orders. They did what they were supposed to do. UNLV just never got to it. So guess what we had to do? We had to send $20 million back to the state because we just couldn't figure it out. Good. So you also have two very large donors that I know who have each complained to me that they've put in calls to the president, even though they know what's happening, they want to give him money. He doesn't return their calls. So when he was out one day, somebody said to him, you haven't returned so-and-so's call. And he, he kind of laughed. He goes, oh, I dropped the ball. Yeah, you dropped the ball. <laughs> oh, you dropped the ball. <clears throat> so I've have, I have a lot of people have reached out to me since this, some who have been, some who do not. Everyone kind of feels the same. But I say to every one of them, it doesn't matter if you think I'm right. You're not saying anything out loud. You're not, I'm the squeaky wheel. So if I'm always the person that they see walking into a room and then I get a collective eye roll, well, look, guys, somebody has to speak up and ha- we have to do something collectively because what is their incentive to ever change anything? Mm-hmm. They have brand new contracts signed. You'll have to buy them out of their contracts. They're all about being tenured. They're untouchable. So what are you going to do about it except 
kind of wring your hands and it's horrible and you're right it is well what does splat look like to you i mean for for the university system in general to really get the memo does it mean donations are withheld does it mean mm -hmm. big companies suddenly come out and say look sorry but you know what we're not going to hire we're not going to hire from these schools for the next year two years i think it's a start because i think that the only thing they understand is a dollar and so i think that is a start um in our system in particular we have a regent system that is huge there's 12 um they're elected when you go to a nevada voting booth there are two different um, seats that are listed at the very bottom of the ballot. It's to be a trustee for the school district, and it's to be a regent for the university system. The two largest budgets in the entire state, they can't allocate funds. How can you possibly understand what's happening and how you do that correctly? So if we're not going to, and, and I'm one of those people too, I'm at fault for that. When I saw regents, at the end of a ballot, I'm like, region, I, okay, maybe I knew the name. Well, that's how people vote, and that's why they're in those offices. So unless we have them appointed, we have some quasi-system of that, that maybe is a step in getting people who are more reasonable. I mean, I would like to see, whether it's school district again or we're talking about higher ed, I would like to see people who have done well in their life. You don't need an ed background. You need, a, you need to understand business. It's, it's reading a P&L, it's allocating funds. Somebody who's done well, who'd be willing to give of their time for however much to, it takes a month, go through those things, make the votes. They, their egos don't depend on it. They have other things to do, they're busy people. Yeah. But they'll get it done. That would be a more effective way, I think, to start to make any changes. But nobody who's in those positions is interested in making the changes. What they do instead is we get a group of regents who complain loudly that they don't get enough parking passes. They don't get enough bling and access to seats at the for the basketball games. Well, why don't you talk about the kids that aren't graduating? Why don't you talk about some other things? It, it just seems to be so upside down to me. Yeah. And, it, and everyone acknowledges it, but kind of shakes their head and walks along. Well, I want to congratulate you for, for taking a stand Actually, that's not true. A lot of people take stands, but you took it publicly. And I had to, because if unless I did that, he would have gotten that letter and thrown in the trash, and nobody would have known I wrote it. Yeah, good point. But I'm going back to the Corolla and the 3500 bucks. Mm. And, you know, there's a guy who was here earlier, Stephen uh, Pressfield, great author, 81 years old now, and we were... We were talking about, you know, the, the unintended consequences of misassigned encouragement, mm -hmm. which is just a click away from enabling, right? Mm. I mean, they're, yeah. they're so adjacent. Right. And I, I, I look at, and I don't want to name names, but big foundation, the biggest foundations in the world. Mm -hmm. And I look at where their money goes, and I look at the amount that goes, and I, I just wonder if the person in charge of, all that gelt of Freuken yep. <laughs> ever says, ever just like walks right up to the mirror and says, am I making it worse? Am I enabling something ultimately with my money? Because it, it, it is tonnage at that point. It's just, you're just 20, 20 bucks is not 200, is not 2000, mm -hmm. is not 20,000. But it's 20 all relative million. to somebody. It's all yeah. relative. It doesn't have to be, have a lot of zeros behind it. I think that's why I stick to a lot of scholarship pieces because the rest is uncontrollable. And I know that this kid for this amount of time wants to walk across that stage and have something to show for it and I'm happy to have them do that. That's something I can get. I would rather I would rather do that all day long every day. And and I don't even I never meet the people really that I scholarship. I very rarely know who they are. But, you know, I went to dinner about two weeks ago and put my credit card out and paid for it. And the waitress came back and said, Ingolstead, yes. She goes, you put my son through college. 
And I said, oh, she goes, thank you. And now he's, he's applied for this. And I go, awesome. I would do that every single day than have the Inglestead wing somewhere. I mean. See, this is, <laughs> this is really down to the nub. And I know we're short on time. But this is, this is what I'm struggling with. You know, I'm, I'm micro works. You're macro works, at least comparatively <laughs> speaking, right? But do you, <laughs> like, to suddenly have that feeling, that connection, through a waitress, mm -hmm. once again, the waitress comes back into the story, right. you know, through the maid. Yeah. You put my kid through school. Let me tell you what my kid's doing. Yeah. That shit matters, man. Yeah, uh, let me do a real quick sidebar. What happened to me a couple months ago, I was in Ridgeway, Colorado, signing whiskey bottles in a little liquor store. Ridgeway. I mean, there's nobody in this town. I didn't think anybody was going to come out. There was a line of people down the street. So flattering. And we're just, I'm just signing and we're laughing. And this guy comes in. He's clearly a laborer or a builder. He couldn't tell. He was dirty and he'd had a long day. And he's holding his cell phone. And he says, uh, hey, man, can I show you something real quick? And I said, sure. And he holds up the phone and he's FaceTiming with his kid. And his kid is about 30 feet up uh, an electric pole. Dug in. Lineman. Mm-hmm. And his buddy's holding the phone. I'd up. want to be yelling, get off the phone. I'm just like, Do <laughs> pay attention to what you're doing. But he just looks down and he yells, Mike Rowe, you paid for this. So yes, that awesome, right? And I look at the old man's got a tear in his eye. Yeah. And he's like, my boy was never going to go to college. Mm -hmm. But six figures keeping the lights on. Nice. Damn right, I'll buy your whiskey. Absolutely. And all of a sudden, and, and to be honest, I was starting to feel a little sorry for myself. I was late for the flight, and people are waiting, and, and I'm like signing whiskey bottles, like, oh, the struggle is real. <laughs> My hand is a cramp. But, <laughs> yeah, but, but you know what I mean. Like, all I, of a sudden, it's, it's, it's those little things. I do because my mother's a very uh, religious person, and um, she has never gone or seen any building we've built. She's never set foot on them one she i took her to betty's village on off hours once um and i was like you know god mom don't you want to you, you you've done some nice things wouldn't you like to see it she said no and I go, well why <laughs> and she said because i know that you're doing that and i know when i go to bed at night and i say my rosary um i know i made somebody else's life better tonight and i don't need to see them and I thought, well, I don't have that faith, <laughs> um, and I'm happy you do. But I get that when I run into the waitress with the sun, and I think, oh, there is something kind of nice to to be, say hearing that or hearing how the story turned out. And isn't that great Look, that he had something? I'd have quit. I'd have quit without those reminders. And I'm fortunate because people know how to find me, and I – Unlike you, who has to call a famous tennis pro in order to get to me. Other people with the internet oh, I bet. <laughs> know how to get to me. Uh oh. <laughs> and, they, and they send pictures and they send, you know, and, and like those little things, like two categories that you need to attend from a diligence standpoint because mm -hmm. you are a steward, mm -hmm. but you, you also need to drink from the well for yourself because you're a human. And it, if you don't get some kind of affirmation, you know, on a manageable human level, then then life becomes about letters like I this. Know. And man, that's not what I want to spend my time do. doing. And you know, to that point, I get to this time of year every year, and I get really cranky. <laughs> I've had a lot of this stuff going on, and yeah. I'm just like, ugh, I'm done. So I leave. I'm, I check out for like two, three months, and I go stare at the ocean. <laughs> and I tell the people in my office, and like, if it's not time sensitive, you're all very capable. Everyone understands what they're doing. I don't want to entertain any questions. I don't want to talk about it. And I come back every September, and I feel great. I have to go and almost unplug and decompress and not know that every time I'm having dinner or meeting somebody, I'm waiting for the shoe to drop because I'm waiting for the ask. And that happens constantly, which is why I don't go to a lot of, I used to go to a lot of different activities I like to do, but I got hit up a lot. So I just don't do it. Yeah. 
And you know what? I just want to go and, and sit with my friends. And my best friends are friends I've had since I was in kindergarten. It's and funny, they don't funny care. how they get more important, isn't it? <laughs> and they don't care what I think about dinner that was served. More or less what I think about anything in the world. Right. <laughs> They're like, pipe down you. And, and that's what I need in my life. I need to have people that knew me when I was missing teeth and had bad skin. <laughs> you played hockey? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I had a family of them. <laughs> Didn't I, learned your to, dad... I learned to skate on ice skates, nice. uh, hockey skates. Didn't your dad build the rink mm-hmm. up there in uh, mm-hmm. North Dakota? Yep, he built it. Oh, that was his. That was his piece of. Um, it was he. He had dedicated the build, building the building before he had a diagnosis. So um, that particular part of the country gets a flood every hundred years. The hundred year flood comes through. I am two weeks away from delivering my daughter, and my grandma's getting moved out of her home into a gymnasium and some school somewhere and. Anyway, my cousin's FEMA comes in. Everyone's sitting in trailers. So my dad decides he's going to build this hockey arena. Not only, I think, because it's where his heart really was. I never saw my dad more relaxed and happier than when he was back up there. And his pals that he'd play with, and they'd sit around and drink and laugh. And um, So he decided to do that. And he uh, gave $100 million, And then he was also the contractor. So <laughs> built it and had a lot of cameras set up all over the place and would watch the construction. And there was a, a controversy at one point in time because they wanted to change the um, mascot. From what? From the Fighting Sioux mm-hmm. to they didn't care what, just mm. not the Fighting Sioux. And to be clear, this is not a woman named Susan. No, this is with an X. Yeah. And they, um, my dad said this, everybody there, it's been, the school's been there 90 years, Everyone graduated as this is what I played under. I'm not going to do that. If you do this, I will stop building. And they said, no, you won't. And he stopped building and let it sit there for a bit. Mm. And then he said, here's the deal, guys. That That's how it works. So then right before it got, oh, it was opened in 2001. So a few months before that, he had his diagnosis and... Um, so when I was telling you when we walked out on that ice, um, everyone is chanting his name. And my dad, who was not a crier, I looked over and he was very teary. And I thought, um, I'm going to get teary. I thought, it's the very first time and it's the last time you're ever going to be on this ice. Oh, wow. And everyone standing here chanting your name doesn't know that. But we know it. And I know what this means. And, you know, he passes, and as soon as he passes, all the people who shared their loyalty and were behind you, Ralph, and that's right, and that logo's correct, every one of them turned. Wow. Because he wasn't there anymore. He wasn't there anymore to fight it. To protect it. So what's it called now? Uh, Well, they call themselves the Fighting Hawks. I don't. Um, They... Yeah, a little switcheroo. They gave a logo, a rendering of what it would look like, which was kind of a morphing of with headdress and it was a hawk. And by the time the rendering came through, it looks like a UPS delivery guy. <laughs> I, I, wait, 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 it, wait. it looks like hockey players yeah, should yeah. be in brown shorts running with a package. You had a headdress <laughs> on a hawk? Well, it was the Sioux. I mean, we're in Indian. We're in native country, right? I, mean, I get it. But... And, and the people who really didn't want it to go away were the Native Americans. Oh. They were the ones, they said, it's the only thing that keeps our name alive. Yeah. And you drive another 60 miles to go on the reservation, you can see why they needed to keep it alive. And so you didn't do anybody any favors. I don't know what, did you improve their lifestyle? Did you help with what's happening on the reservation? Or you made yourselves feel a lot better because it was a horrible thing to be called. You just, you just put it further out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. Look, we did a good thing. A virtue. Did you? That's the, did you? That's the government. The government's given more money to Native Americans than anybody else in the nation. And mm-hmm. the the state of the reservations, it's, it's like what you were saying earlier. You know, you, you've got to follow through with stuff. You've got to build something. You can't just write a check. It doesn't well, work. Well, and what I didn't realize till I got into that was um so I, I could see there was a lot of need out there and 
so we had had some discussions about building a home because there's a lot of homeless kids. There's a lot of drug use. There's a lot of alcoholism. And it's a harsh climate. Trying to build something that they could have. But as I learned, the tribal leaders aren't any different than any politician anywhere. And so the people I was dealing with who wanted to build this wanted it built outside the limits of the reservation because they didn't trust the elders to do anything. Yeah. So it doesn't matter whether you're talking about the U.S. government or that. If you get people that get some level, or the regents, or trustees, they get some level of power, yeah. they will not let that go. And, and maybe you're <laughs> the threat to that because you don't need them for anything. And in fact, you control a sizable asset. And if they take that, well, does that somehow emasculate them? Does that somehow uh, reveal their vulnerability, yeah. their their submissive posture? Whatever? I actually think the power, if if there's a, if 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 I hold any power, it would be that I have the ability to speak freely. So you can't, um, you're not going to take my job. You're not going to cost me my home. You're not going to. You can say whatever you like. I have my five friends. I'm fine. I have the ability to say it and not have any repercussions other than maybe you just don't like me, and that's okay. But other people don't. They're dissatisfied as well, but they are afraid they'll get fired. They are afraid that it'll be taken out on their kid at school. They are afraid of that, and that shouldn't be either. You realize what, I mean, what you've truly inherited. Your dad's demand <laughs> around that mascot name and his, I mean, they basically dared him, right? Like, mm-hmm. oh, you're not going to stop building it. Mm-hmm. And of course he would. Mm-hmm. And I, I wonder somewhere in this guy's mind, he's like, you're not going to take the money. You're not going to pull the plug. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I will. Yes, so. and I'm not doing it to drive you to your knees or bring you to the table. I, you know, have told you all the way along the line, I'm unhappy. This doesn't work. I don't understand. Help me understand. And everything, here, here's what I find is an exception at universities. There's arrogance everywhere. But the arrogance with somebody there is that if you have a name and you have letters after your name, you assume that you are smarter than every person that you're talking to. And you haven't generally worked outside of a very insulated system. So you're protected in every way. You have no idea what it means to make your own money, to make a payroll, to make budget. You're accountable. If you don't bring it in that quarter, you don't get any money either. They have no concept of it, and yeah. that's how they treat people. I know we're super long, but I got one last question. I'm, sure. I'm, I'm going to let you go. Um, so sometimes I feel like we're shooting with a shotgun, mm-hmm. and sometimes I feel like we are with a rifle. Right now, Chuck and half a dozen other people are going through a giant stack of work ethic scholarships And we are weighing and measuring, and we're trying to find the best people we can find. And it's very difficult to look into their hearts. You know, it's very. Do they do a a tape with it? Do you see any uh, video of them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a one minute video they have to do uh, where actually what what they're asked is to provide a 13th statement for the sweat pledge. Okay. And if you're applying for, you know, a second round scholarship, show us a day in the life of, you know, what you do. And those are great as well. Okay. So there are ways, none of them are perfect, but there are ways to try and, you know, assess who you're talking to. But the question is, should I be helping as many people as I can modestly? In other words, no full rides, Mm -hmm. because I want them to have some skin in the game. Or do I really narrow that more like a rifle and say, I'm going to help a much smaller group of people, but I'm going to do everything I can to make sure we've got the very, very, very best quantity quality through the lens of philanthropy, which I know you uh, don't like. If you helped a smaller group, though, what is it you think would be different that you could accomplish rather than having a wider range? So that's a great question. And the answer is it it, it goes to the real charter of MicroWorks, which is not to help the maximum number of people. It's to help enough people who truly exemplify the qualities we're trying to encourage and then do what we just did in Nevada. Mm-hmm. Get the press out. Tell their stories. 
right? Both at the front end and the back end. So we're very much at the front end over at, at, at Western. Right. But to go back and talk to people now, you know, a, a, a welder, a, a, a plumber, an electrician, five, six years later, like to sit down with them like this and to get, if that person can tell me the right story, their story, the right way, with a measure of pride and verisimilitude and so forth, that will do more to persuade parents and mm -hmm. other kids and guidance counselors, right? So I'm trying to take the long view, but I also want to help as many people, but the, it always comes down to degrees, right? So I would say, and I'll speak for myself, is that I can go in and speak to a group of people, and I am a privileged, older, white lady who they probably hear talk and go, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> now, I can get a kid who I scholarshiped who's maybe five years older than these kids to come back and talk to them, and they're paying attention because they get this person. So I wonder if for you, let's say it's a welder. You know who's completed your program and who's really excelled. You know who that person is or people. Have What about if they come back to the people who are applying to be welders, let's say? Mm -hmm. And there do the one-on-ones because, hey, I went through it. It's hard. I get it. I thought of giving up too, but this is what I did. That they might give them, and feel free to call me during your two years, your year, your journey. If you feel like you can't, call me. Well, that's the idea. I mean, I because they're welders, they have jobs. They work right. 60 hours a week plus over, you know, all, right? So I can't send them out into the world as an ambassador, but I can sit down with them, get them on the record, and then put money behind those conversations mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we are doing that um and we're going to do a lot more of it but you know would i rather that welder be someone who we who whose educations and certification we funded entirely or one of four because you know how the game works now yeah. right kids who need a scholarship might apply for 10 of them you know and they'll cobble it all together and then and they almost have to exactly have because to. the prices got yep. awful crazy everywhere but again, that's, you know, and, and, and we're so small, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, but, I, but I feel like you're probably wrestling with a similar Well, my, my, my talking points when I go forward, and look, I have a daughter who got the same degrees I did. She got a psych degree. I did psych. I did social work. My son got a finance degree. But my talking point is, if you're going to go into liberal arts, find something, figure something else out. Because the way the market is now, unless you are a doctor, an engineer, something that, that takes a specific skill set that you can earn the money to pay for that loan, awesome. But you're being sold a bill of goods on a liberal arts degree that for the most part, the money you're putting in is not the ROI. It's not what you're going to get. And it's going to take you how long you're being sold a bill of goods that may or may not work for you. And you really need to have the full scope of what this means before you commit. And so I think the gift of scholarship, and even if they put some skin in the game, is that you get more of an even playing field when you get to start. You know, starting isn't um, when you start school. Starting is like, okay, now I've kind of have a, I've got some skill. I can figure this out. But what's it worth? Is it worth what what you think you put into it? Yeah. Look, I mean, until you came along, frankly, we, we, every so often, we'd pay the full boat for, for a superstar. Mm -hmm. But what we're doing in Nevada at Western, and, and I want people to understand this because I, I do want to replicate it in other states, that's a full ride. Now, it's a longer tail. You know, it's going to take them four years to get through that high school. Mm -hmm. But they know now in their freshman class that there is a brass ring at the end of it, and it's completely paid for. I think that's more powerful, but, you know, you play the cards you get, right? Well, and it's powerful when you can get the parents in. So in this particular high school, um, you have a lot of single-parent households, you, have, you know, or, or two parents in a house that are just working really hard. If you get, if the parents know there's some option for Johnny, all he needs to do is hit these different benchmarks that are going to be in place, not I'm most proud of the fact not based on a GPA. If you've been failed, why would you do well scholastically? 
but based on you know attendance are you a disciplinary issue what's the problem here it i think it takes the parent because johnny doesn't get it four years to him seems like 40. the parent needs to be the one to reinforce 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 you can get this done and since you know we made the announcement with you um i've had more people from trade schools reach out and say We'd love to participate. Oh, that's great. We'd love to come in the school. We'd love to start with those kids. I, I didn't know that we had behind Allegiant Stadium where the Raiders play, we have a big water tank underground that they teach underwater welding in. Yeah. No idea. Yeah. No that's, idea. I learned that. I No clue. I narrated the series about the building oh. of that stadium. What would your dad say if he could look? down and see Allegiant Stadium. I mean. uh, he'd be really pissed they didn't use local labor. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I bet he would. It I was the lack of local labor was an issue. <laughs> Chris, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're humbled and grateful oh, that you support no. MicroWorks, and it's really cool of you to come here and talk. Candidly well, thanks for it. taking my phone call. Well, look, it wasn't easy. <laughs> it wasn't easy. Once we got through that Andre guy. Yeah, yeah what, this guy? You were a out. piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him I said hello, by the way. I will. And one I of will. these days, we're going to drag his uh, retired ass in here and sit and, him down and for a his, chat. And his wife, who is delightful. So I hear. Yeah. Thanks, son. All right. Thank you. If you like what you heard. And even if you don't. Oh, won't you please. Won't you please. Pretty please. Pretty please. Subscribe. Well, I hate to beg and I hate to plead, but please.